Artificial intelligence, all your jobs are belong to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Hi, I'm the, I am the AI representing the moderator that <laughs> should be here in this body at this point, but has now done 17 or 18 or 431 something <laughs> this weekend. I'm Jim Nettles. Um, I write science fiction, urban fantasy, horror, a bit of this, that, and the other. I write a bunch of stuff in nonfiction. Um, data private security, entrepreneurship, blah, 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 a bunch of stuff for business for creatives. Um, I actually, amongst everything else, I do some stuff in game industry. One of the things that we have currently, we're, we're currently working on and we have out in, uh, the first product out in beta is actually an AI, uh, it's a blend of scripted and AI property where what we're actually doing, and I'll talk more about it, but basically we can take people's story worlds book series, everything else, and let you dive into them and play. Ames, we'll kick Jim off this panel if you want to be on it. <laughs> Aww. Oh, hey, everybody. I am Andrew Greenberg. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. As a game developer, I've been designing AI, which is very different than what we're dealing with, uh, we're talking about today, for many, many years. Uh, but and in the GGDA, we uh, do work with folks who are looking to use the current AI tools to support their game development, not to create the games for them. And in addition, I run the uh, Game Tech Hub Accelerator, where we fund startups who are developing technology for the video game industry. And needless to say, a number of them have been AI projects. Hello, my name is Michelle Davis. I'm an attorney based here in Atlanta at Arnold Golden Gregory. Um, I'm in the technology transactions group, so I'm a transactional attorney uh, handling mostly contracts, uh, software licensing, um, I, but my background is actually in entertainment law and I worked uh, primarily with musicians in that space and still get to work with artists at AGG. Um, and uh, of course, their music has been implicated by AI as much as any other creative industry since in the wake of fake Drake, as I like to say. Um, and very excited to speak to you all about the legal implications. I'm James Ashley. I'm an <laughs> AR developer designer. Um, I work for as a manager for a company in Redmond, Washington. And one of we'll the big things going on there everywhere is lots of tech companies are trying to figure out what do we do with AI, even if it's just a matter of putting AI on our name so that we can get extra money from our investors. <laughs> uh, it's huge right now. So let me kind of start with an idea. How many, how many of you guys have actually played with a generative AI tool? Hurrah. All right. How many of you actually know what you're playing with? <laughs> I don't know that before the egg. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd kind of like to actually start talking a little bit about the models, challenges we've got. So I am a, I am a creator. I'm, I'm not going to say content creator. I do that too. I run a whole virtual network for creatives because apparently I thought I would sleep two hours a night. <laughs> um, when we look, there's a lot of challenges with how these models have been taught. Right? If we talk about a large language model such as chat GPT, a lot of copyrighted language, properties, things like that have been pulled in and adopted and used to train. And there's a lot of questions, lawsuits going on, and I feel sure we'll have a little bit of that conversation here. <coughs> if we look, I, an even larger problem goes into things like music and artwork because when you put things into the blender of an LLM for language and a couple of iterations, it turns it in a nice blender and things become much less obvious. However, with imagery and artwork, we've seen much greater problems and much greater traceability to people's assets, properties, things like that. I know a lot of people that are involved in a lot of lawsuits. I've been consulting on some of them. Um, so there's a lot out there. So why would I, as a creator, as somebody who has ethically challenged a lot of the stuff about AI, build a game company? There's the other side of this. I'm a tech guy. I spent, I've spent. i worked around generative technologies for about 15 years. I've worked with a lot of business intelligence and other forms of machine intelligence for 30 something years. I understand that the technology is here. It is not going away. And we have to understand and accept that there are ethical implications to the technologies that have been created. And we have patterns for this going back centuries where we have things that have been problematically created. 
second edition of this book right here, the main reason the second edition is out is because I added a chapter and a large chunk about generative AI, the issues, what it really is and isn't, and ethical concerns, and the ways that it may be ethically able to be used. So I'm going to throw down to my panelists here, what are your kind of biggest concerns about generative AI? What does it mean for the, the creative space, the gaming space? You know, what are the things that you see here that will be problematic and challenges? Want to start at the end? or? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, for, for me, the biggest problem, just using it is a fantastic thing. It makes everything go faster. I would say at first there's a sense that you're not being as much of a creative or an artist, you know, that somehow you're losing that. And it turns out not to be the case. You can be a lot more productive with these tools because at the end of the day, you're making the calls, you're deciding what looks good and what doesn't, what reads well and what, you know, just sounds silly. But probably for me, the biggest concern is impersonation, that using these tools, uh, dishonest people can very easily pretend to be real people. and the barrier has always been to this sort of deceit is uh, can you mass produce it? And with AI tools, you can mass produce deceit, send out thousands of uh, corrupt letters to uh, our grandparents and get rid of all the spelling errors and actually make it a lo look a lot more legit than it really is. Um, that will definitely be my biggest fear going forward. So what I've seen in the sort of creative space is I think of it in sort of three different phases. So you have the data that's coming in that the AI is learning from. And the issues there are, is it infringing just by, by virtue of using that information and learning from it? Is that a copy in and of itself? And to what extent are they getting permission from the creators to use their work to feed and teach the AI? Um, and, and it's not really so straightforward if that is clearly infringement or not, so we might get into that later. Um, then the second sort of phase is what's, what's kind of being cranked out, right, the, the output. And is it um, going to actually provide, uh, is it c competing with the market for other work that's out there? Are there publicity rights violations where the work is being impersonated, uh, people claiming that it's written by someone else and trying to monetize that? And the third area, which I think is overlooked, is the prompts that you put in to get an output, because there is private information that could potentially be put in there. Um, there is copyright protected information that could be entered in as well. And so having a good understanding of what the AI systems are doing with the information that you feed in order to create some sort of output. Um, lot, there's really more questions than answers, where, but <laughs> there we'll, we can kind of have the thought exercise on you know where the courts might come down on this eventually. Yeah, excellent. And part of the problem we're having is that we are seeing these very big creators, i.e. companies in Redmond, that are owning uh, what they're putting together. As James also noted, uh, these are great tools but right already the most valuable publicly available version is chat gpt enterprise with a bit of a hefty cost uh eventually there are open source ai tools that are out there and we'll all eventually have our own ai agents just like we won't all have our own websites right now but clearly those big corporate owned ones are significantly ahead of those that we can generate on our own and as James pointed out, the advantage you get from using these already is significant, and it's only going to get more and more extreme. We already know that all the major financial houses have their own internally and are cranking on these to generate as much money for themselves as possible and uh, developing more and more of their own proprietary tools. At what point are we peons left with this barely usable uh, version of AI and the walled garden has made the have and have not systems significantly worse than it is even now? And I'm going to add a couple of other concerns on top of this. The first of which is, uh, and this ties into things like we see with the current guild strike, the writer's guild strike, the SAG, all of this sort of stuff is there's a lot of concern about taking people's IP and, and commercializing it. So there's, a, you know, in other words, one of the biggest challenges that comes out of using these tools is that what it gives you is a couple of things. It gives you a big echo chamber. <laughs> it gives you an echo chamber that tends to go senile. 
it gives you an echo chamber that, depending on the guardrails put around it, can be very manipulative or hallucinative or, you know, just plain out, passed out in the street, you know, like some people were last night. It, you know, not anyone on the, up here. <laughs> it was me. All right. But, it, you know, the big echo chamber. And one of the other things is this. Um, because I deal with this, I, a lot of the time I get pulled into things around IP, IP development, mm -hmm. putting the company structure around it, things like this. Is that, you know, we've already, the Copyright Office has already ruled if it's created by generative AI, it's not copyrightable, it's not protectable, it is public domain. So this is one of the big incentives with the major studios to go and say, hmm, okay, if it, I don't own it, what it, to what extent do I have to develop it to say I own it? There's a lot of stuff there about that we might touch on. But the other thing is this, is we're seeing a flood of this material come into Amazon and a lot of these products that is not being identified and declared as being created. The truth of it is it's generating a bunch of average crap <laughs> not superior crap average, average crap. crap because it's going that's what it's designed to do it's you know chat gpt is a predictive engine that is a little bit more effective than the predictive text on your phone and some of y'all have heard me say this bad joke already just groan you know it's that predictive text that can't remember it's not ducking <laughs> okay you've heard me say it 12 times so you know, those kinds of problems being accepted is that the quality of the material you're going to get gives you a starting point. This is the value of the tools is you can use it for a starting point. The problem is we see a lot of people trying to use it as an end point and selling programs on Facebook that tell you, oh, you can write a book in a day and it's not going to cost you anything. Just pay us $2,000 and we'll teach you how to do it. And they're going to go stick it on Amazon and it's garbage. We're having conversations with a number of companies like this, publishing houses, people like this, to go and talk about the fact that there is value in scanning and grading material. And if people are found to be submitting straight up just generative work, blacklist them from the industry because they can't sign a contract that says this is my work. If they send it to Amazon, they're certifying that, no, this is my original work. So how are they getting around that? They're going and declaring ChatGPT is my co-creator. <laughs> I haven't seen anyone actually do that. Are they, are they actually saying that it's co-creator? They, they tried to register a copyright as a work for hire, and the oh, AI is the work, the employee. Yeah. I'm just going to say bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so That's what the Copyright Office said. <laughs> yes, it did. So let's talk about how can some of these things be used positively, creatively, constructively, because, again, it's a tool set, right? So, Michelle, I want to start with you on this. With the ideas of using it constructively, creatively in this space, while we acknowledge that there are ethical and technological issues, from a legal perspective, when you look at this and have that idea, what are your thoughts about where this is going to go? So, in terms of ownership of the output, what the Copyright Office has said is that there has to be some level of human authorship. And so the question is, at what point does AI go from being more like a paintbrush to more like the painter? So you can use it as a tool, and I think those are the best sorts of use cases. So you, maybe not to write your whole book, but to help you proofread it, to find um, discrepancies, fact checking perhaps, um, looking for inspiration uh, for initial concepts. Uh, I mean, you see that even in the legal industry. Um, you know, there was an attorney that very infamously now got in trouble with the courts because he tried to present research that he found from chat GPT, which was just a hallucination. It was totally fabricated. Um, so you, you should not use AI to do your legal research. And um, still billing the hours for it. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so now what you see, I mean, what you see in courts is judges um, actually having orders that say, if you have used AI in the production of any of these legal documents, you have to let us know. And so I think that that's going to be a common trend across other industries, as you gave it the example of Amazon, that you have to um, sign off at least contractually and say, if you've used AI and to what extent. 
And the same is true with a, a, an original work. If you've used it as a tool, you might need to sort of um, mention that it's been used the same way you would a sample in a song where I'm copywriting this song, but this little sample, that, that piece is not mine, that belonged to someone else. This little piece was maybe AI generated. Um, so I think it's all about a smart use case and, and, and thinking of them as uh, tools rather than the creative <laughs> entities themselves. Andrew, you know, kind of what, your, what are your thoughts on, from a gaming industry side of things, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, obviously D&D &D already got in trouble with AI-generated art in one of the source books, and huge backlash, and legitimately so, because the fan base is buying what they believe to be human-generated. A lot of us do buy because we know the folks who are credited on it, and we want to see their works. And if it's not them, I mean, it is it is a cheat by them. And um, that backlash was quick and strong, and they've said they will not do that again. And I think we're going to see that continually on the gaming side. Uh, on the flip side, uh, game companies, I mean, we've been using AI forever. My games, going back to the early 90s, we've been testing purely with AI. We do multiplayer games, and the AI can handle every player position. We want to run that game for thousands of turns beyond what humans will do. We're not going to sit there and do it. We have the computer handle that side for it. But the computer's not going to create this stuff. On yet another hand, I'm running into becoming an octopus now with those hands, um, <laughs> We do believe that the AI has a role in creating a more satisfying experience for the player. I said I've been an AI designer in games for a long time, and the argument at our company has been, what the hell does that actually mean? What is the AI in the game? Yeah, we have algorithms to decide pathing and to what path it'll take and how it should function, etc. but that's not intelligence. These are simple algorithms. So the general idea we came up with was that the AI is what has the game create a positive experience for the players? I do these big strategy games, Emperor of the Fading Suns, Battles of Destiny, etc. I can't figure out every combination of what players will do and script for those. We have to put in these general algorithms for the AI will follow to create that satisfying experience for the player. Game designers can create AI that no player could ever defeat for their games, but that's not what we want. We want a challenge, but we want it to be fun, satisfying, etc. So the AI needs to create that satisfying experience. And I think this is going to be true across all of creative works. That AI needs to have this level that it supplies to, and then we make it really cool and interesting and thankfully trademarkable and copyrightable. James, thoughts? I'll take the opposite view. Yay! All right. <laughs> uh, Street I would say, let's say <laughs> authenticity and authorship and ownership are really aspects of late stage capitalism, right? If you go Ooh. back in time, <laughs> you've got Alexander Dumas had you know, a whole factory of writers who would write the chapters for him and he'd just pull them together, fix them up, stitch it together, and it seemed totally reasonable to have a literary factory. You had your great Renaissance painters who similarly had journeymen under them who did most of the early work and the early stage work. And again, the master would just bring it all together, but didn't particularly have an idea that, you know, they had to personally do everything. They simply supervised. And to me, it seems like that's what we would should use AI for. And we're just hitting this bump now where we're getting over our notions about authorship and how things should be done and what does it mean to be an artist. And we can just move on to something new where it's really a matter of these are tools for us to pull together better material, better books, better art. And I'm sure pretty soon in the next five years we'll find a major sci-fi author who will print a book and it'll turn out, you know, he used AI to do it. In fact, I, I suspect Charlie Strauss has been doing it for years. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it'll happen soon. <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm going to preface this. I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular project and why, and a bit of what we're doing and why. Um, we started with an idea where we were experimenting with some things, and we the first generation we built was called Story Engine, where what we did was we created a setup, and we were playing with language models. We were playing with the text. We built basically, everybody remember the old Zork and the good old text-based games and stuff like that? We played with going and creating an experience where we could put guardrails and, and some events in and around it and use generative images as well to sort of reflect the scenery. And I turned it loose on a bunch of my writer friends. That was an interesting choice. Um, 
some of the images that came back like one friend of mine he managed to make you know bring you know prompt it to turn into optimus prime and he we wound up creating some interesting images of a very noir looking optimus <laughs> prime in the shadows another friend of mine who might write, write romance got it down to the point where a cowboy was making out with a snake <laughs> <laughs> So then we started looking at the second generation, and now we're kind of into the third generation of the beta, where what we really have focused on is character interaction. Um, we relied a lot on looking, and basically it's, it's built around being a, you know, an RPG. And so we focused very much on the interaction between the player character and the non-player characters, and introductions, and your stats mean a lot. We carry state history. So it remembers, oh, I haven't seen you in a month, or I haven't seen you in two hours. It remembers and says, you pissed me off yesterday. <laughs> it re you know, so characters can build real relationships, and we don't entirely even understand all the relationships we've seen being built between some of our characters. And what we're building with the given world in this particular, this is where it beta, um, what the what we ultimately will land on is going to be a world where we are working with authors and creators to create storylines, um, and we will take those, turn the the static part of the story into the setups, into the maps, into everything, so it's playable. There's quests, <coughs> there are puzzles to be solved, there's combat, and monsters to be killed, all this kind of fun stuff, and all of that will be done with scripted engines and work from authors and creators. We will then use the generative AI to create unique experiences based on how did you really react? What did you say to someone? To create much more realistic dialogue. And this is where we have been focused for a while and we're actually pretty happy with where we're at with that language model and that's what's out. Um, object permanence for us is coming out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're waiting on one of our partner companies. We're doing some API work right now, and we'll be looking at having um, the the next generation of it with combat and things like that. So we're already working with our authors, and ultimately we're going to have start with four universes. One is this kind of standard Middle Ages. The second is going to be a urban fantasy, paranormal romance kind of you know freaky modern day sort of thing. The third is going to be a sci-fi cyberpunk kind of environment, and the fourth is going to be focused purely on story. And romance, and that's where we're starting with these on the project. Why not a West world? <laughs> um, <laughs> we actually do have other. We're, we're gonna. So we've, we're kind of using these as the four basics, um, and we're gonna see what we get, and we're gonna be continuing to build them. Part of the reason I'm going with this is because these are authors and creators I know whose IP they're interested in bringing, because we will be able to go and say, "Hey, you're about to step in the world of." John Hartness. We were gonna. We had originally planned to have a Bubba the Monster Hunter story set here at Dragon Con <laughs> to roll out as the premiere, um, and we just didn't get that far. But the plan will be to have it here for next year, and it'll be something that is available only for Dragon Con attendees. You'll get a little NFT token, and you'll be able to have it and go play it. Um, so part of the reason, purely selfishly, is I'm working with people I know and trust, and that trust me. And he's going to capture all their language and sell it to Amazon. No, wait. No. And, <laughs> and one of the things that we are doing, because I'm currently starting to look at the architecture and what we're going to use, we're going to build our own LLM where we're protecting the IP. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, got to come up to the mic. the mic. Okay. And while he's doing that, remember, you can rate this session already in your app. Just go ahead and give it that five. Get it out of the way now. <laughs> So are you going to be doing the same sort of thing for the generative images then? Are you going to be taking a couple of artists and saying, give us a bunch of samples that we can program with? Or are you using something like mid-journey? The short, the short answer is yes, that is where we're headed. Okay. Um, is we're going to be using a blend of artist images for the static images that we're using throughout a lot of places and generated, in, uh, generated images. But our intention is going to be to build our own imaging model as well. That's going to be a little bit further down because that's a lot more processing. Yeah. Um, but that is one of those things that's coming. Okay. Um, and I, I, you know, so if you are interested after we're done, come grab a card and you can follow the project and the stuff we're doing. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, 
So building off the conversation that started with think of this as a tool and more building off of James' point and his perspective that he raised, um, especially as the discussion of authorship and ownership has evolved over time, and especially since copyright was introduced in modern capitalism for the free market and to support that. And we've been seeing today as artists move more towards Patreon, Subscribestar, Coffee, and more directly paying the author. And those kinds of formats and platforms don't really push for copyright, um, especially a lot of artists and creatives that I support through those platforms don't really use copyright for any of their works. Um, then they're idiots. <laughs> They well, have they, copyright. They, they have copyright, but if they're not registering them, there's a yeah. problem. So the point I was, or a question I was building towards, is as this tool evolves and becomes smarter over time, eventually it's going to become, in my opinion, akin to Word or Excel or any normal mm -hmm. everyday tool that we use all the time, every time. And once we get there, it kind of throws into question. Do we need to sign a document for every little thing that we do in our day-to-day -day lives to say that AI has been used for this, for so, everything? Actually, I, I, that's a question I've got I want to throw up here. We discussed this earlier on one of the other AI panels. If you can hold on to that question, um, I'd like to dive into that. But I, here, let me throw in the question I wanted to based on the setup I prefaced. Because, again, since we're here talking about game and game development, I'd like to see what you guys' thoughts are in terms of other models, other ways you think we're going to see the gaming, because then what I want to talk about is going to be driving towards exactly your question, because I want to talk a little bit about things like Photoshop, other tools and things, because right now I want to talk a little bit about the societal issues and the business issues. But I am going to be a good little capitalist, because if I'm the one that's funding it, driving it, and building it, <laughs> and I am also a firm believer that creators have a right to get paid for their work. Well, so, I mean, clearly in game dev, we've been using AI and scripting and so forth for a long time to develop things. There are companies out there that use AI long before this to do basis of level design. Here are my assets, start throwing them together using these parameters, then let me flesh that out uh, more completely. They're the biggest companies in the world have been doing this already and have been using ChatGPT to get stuff to the concept <laughs> artists, et cetera. I know a lot of... 3D uh, artists, renders, animators who would love to have a tool that would do the very basics of 3D animation for them, put the bones together when they get a new 3D model, do the very basic sequences so they can do the cool stuff. This is the amplification side. I want to get that weak of drudgery out of the way so I can do a cool death scene and not just make sure the arm actually goes next to the avatar and doesn't go across the room doing a, uh, who knows what else. So there are a lot of ways we want AI to handle that uh, to handle that for us. Um, the, the bigger question is, uh, what will it do effectively in, in the long run? When you're talking about the far future for it, I mean, there are companies right now that really want to have the whole thing turned out by AI. We could have had a million more Flappy Bird style games all done by AI with Woo! no difficulty. And uh, we saw how many there were uh, uh, to begin with. So uh, I talked about before that, that some of this has to be on us as the consumers to know what's out there, know what's in, but, but just take it for granted that every game dev company is using this to some degree to get to that point where humans can really do the, can really do the, uh, the incredible stuff and that's going to be a fun part of it. And, and to, the, to the question of what should we assume that they're using already for it, I talked about the accelerator I run, I take it for granted that every single application I get took at least one pass through ChatGPT before it got to me. I'm taking this for granted now and everything I see on social media, a lot of the emails I get, it went through ChatGPT at some point. I think you're the best one qualified on this one as well. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't want the end result for us to flag any time it's been used. I think that would obviously be excessive and I think that's a, a risk in the, depending on how the courts sort of see things. So. You know, it's interesting, as Andrew describes how AI has been used uh, in game development, all these sort of um, descriptions of how characters move and scenes feel, the, none of that is copyrightable. It's not protectable information. Um, and, you know, it, it, so much comes down to how the technology is used. If you have um, a database filled with 
let's say thousands and thousands of images and you create something from that, is any one little piece, can you even trace where, how it was informed and where it came from? And if it's so <coughs> minute, um, that's probably not even copyright protected. And we have, the copyright law actually has a caveat for this kind of thing and it's called fair use. It's a very gray area, mm -hmm. it's a balancing test of four different factors, blah, 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 um, without getting into the copyright 101, which I think was an earlier panel. But you know, we have some precedent here. There's Authors Guild versus um, Google, uh, where Google was basically scanning books to archive them, and the courts ended up ruling that that was a fair use um, because of how they were copying the books. So we're waiting to see. Um, you know, now with all the sort of class action lawsuits, like the Sarah Silverman sort of been the face of uh, the one against uh, OpenAI and Meta. Um, but, you know, when you create a work, as soon as it is fixed in a tangible medium, when the code is written or the song lyrics are, are written down or the song's recorded or pictures taken, you own copyright, whether you, whether you believe in copyright or not, it is yours. Um, and the, when you own copyright in the US, you have these exclusive bundle of rights of what you can do with that underlying work. You, only you can copy it, distribute it, make derivative works from it, publicly perform it, and so forth. So what we're still trying to understand is how AI works. Is that actually making a copy of the work in a way that is infringement? Is it copying um, in a way that might be fair use? Is the output a derivative work in a way that is infringement? Um, and if so, you know, do we do we hold the AI systems liable or the person feeding you know the prompt to create that output? And uh, really, like in all things, whenever you ask a lawyer something, we sort of famously say <laughs> it, it depends. depends. <laughs> yeah, I've never been on a panel where that hasn't come up, so I had to had to do it. But it, but it's true. So I think instead of thinking of this like, is this infringement or not, it's more like, what are the arguments that it is? What are the arguments that it is not? And then, you know, seeing where the scale sort of is balanced. Um, I, I don't know that I answered the question. I forgot what it was. Ah, well. <laughs> so James, can you make up the answer to the question? We've all forgotten what I asked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, man. It's like, <laughs> okay, so what we've seen over the past decade or so is we've destroyed the publishing industry because of micro patronages uh, through online money things, thank goodness for PayPal and all of that. The world has changed, right? And if we just go a step further, it makes sense to me that I don't care if something's written by an AI or a person with an AI. If I like the work and people I trust like it, that should be the important thing and I'd be happy to give them money. Um, to actually have control and be able to say these are the things I enjoy in my life rather than to have large centralized uh, heavily capitalized studios and publishers and so on helping determine what I like. So there's an upside to it. It also means that people just starting off if they do great things are able to find success much more easily than they have in say 20 years ago where you had to find a publisher or you had to find a studio that would back you and take a big cut of your money for many, many years. So I want to throw one more question out here, kind of quick answers, and then we're going to dive into the questions. Um, so I mean, again, this is, we've talked about this as a tool set. You know, we've seen, I remember, because I used to be a photographer, I did a lot of it back in the day when I was doing a lot of journalism. Photoshop was, oh my God, Photoshop's, you know, digital cameras, Photoshop, this is going to destroy photography. Whole industry is going to go away. No. Do you remember when photography was going to destroy painting? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> radio destroyed. So, I mean, MTV TV, TV killed the, the radio, radio star. star. Yeah, radio <laughs> killed live performance. <laughs> okay, I think we got the answer there on that one. Um, so, your question. Hello, uh, I think this is probably a question more for Michelle uh, again. So I use an uh, app called Pixel Meter, uh, which is very similar to Photoshop in a lot of ways, and I never really paid attention to it, but there's a feature within it called Super Resolution, and it upscales the image, and when you look closely, it's using machine learning to do this. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of features like that that have kind of been scattered around, and going back to what we were saying earlier, if we do get to a point where people want you to legally disclose that you know, you've used 
used AI, there's a very good chance you aren't even going to know that you've used it. And I don't know how that could be enforceable in any way, but maybe it is. I, I'm not really, yeah, I, I'm trying to ask the Oracle here. I know it's impossible to tell the future. But. Yeah. So what's interesting about where you've seen people asking for these sort of um, um, notice or, or whatever you want to call it, in the court system, when if a judge says, let us know if you use AI, that probably means it's an old judge that does not like AI and is scared of it, um, which is a very different sort of situation from somebody uh, entering into a contract wanting to buy something and wanting some sort of a warranty or indemnity that it, there's no infringement, that someone's going to come after them. So I, that I think it's a really good question because um, just because AI is tacked to it doesn't mean infringement. Right, it's, um, I think we've seen already a lot of attacking sort of the wrong AI tools in the wrong ways. If you're familiar with like the ProseCraft um, uh, system where they were taking text from books um, and analyzing it and it was really just information about words usage and um, how long the page, how many pages are words, you know, that kind of stuff. Not the actual text, but people said they're, they take our book and they're using it to feed their machine without paying us and that's wrong. And I don't know that that's, it's certainly not a copyright infringement issue. So I, it really, it's, it comes down to the same copyright principles we have now. To show infringement, you have to show that there's substantial copying and you have to show that there is actual access. So for you as an artist, if you're putting some work out there, I don't really care what tools you use as much as, is this substantially similar to somebody else's work? And did you have access to that work? Did you actually copy? And at the end of the day, that's, that's what, if I'm, li if I'm licensing work from you, that's what I'd be concerned about. Thank okay. you. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add to that, because this kind of goes back to your question as well, um, is the idea that fundamentally now, and I've been having this con conversation with a number of IP attorneys, contracts are going to publishers um, in a number of spaces. Physically now, especially as a writer, there is no way to attest there was no AI involved. Microsoft Word, all the Microsoft products has it now embedded. If you've been using ProWriting Rate, Grammarly, all those different tools for years, those all use certain parts of, of AI <coughs> tools. So we've been talking about what does the attestation mean and really trying to get it down to the f core factor of is this truly your creative work? Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of questions going forward is at what point, and I think this is going to be the thing for the attorneys as we go forward with cases, you know, if I go out there and say, write me a short horror story in the style of Stephen King based on, you know, um, a pig farm run wild, um, if I do that and I say write it in that style and it's that close and I go submit that as my work and I've done nothing substantial to it. Um, so we, I don't think we're in a position anymore to say no, there's been no AI in it and truthfully we haven't been there for a while but most people didn't know the tools that we're using. I used to uh, deal with a tabletop game designer in the pre-AI days who rather famously said creativity is hiding your sources, which is something I've always disagreed with. Creativity is honoring your sources and going above and beyond what you got from them. And I think we're going to see this sort of uh, disparity come out more and more. The best stuff will be using the tools. The worst stuff will be relying on them. I mean, copyright law already deals with this struggle of, um, you know, if we don't have to have AI, we can have just regular human brains and trying to decipher when someone is inspired by something versus when they've copied something. And it's not easy to tell. And, um, you know, the same like with the Stephen King example, if there's nothing in that final text that is actually verbatim Stephen King's original work, that output in, its, in and of itself is not going to be copyright infringement because he can't have a copyright in his style yet, right? um, mm -hmm. unless the course finds something different. Um, so that's kind of why they're looking at not so much the output, but it's just the, the technology itself already infringing by using the work um, in that way in the back end, no matter how it ends up being outputted, if it is. Um, yeah. And game mechanics are not copyrightable. So if you want to have the AI tell you how to do your UI and how to go ahead and have the mechanics work, et cetera, et cetera, it's as protected as it would have been otherwise. Now, if you, now if you had that example and you said, um, 
this is a work co-written by Stephen King, or you used his name or in, <laughs> and used his name to sell it, then you get into the publicity rights spectrum, and you can't use somebody else's sort of name, image, likeness to make money without their permission. So that's a, a different area of law. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, I love cybersecurity, and so I was wondering, how do you view cybersecurity with AI? And like, if the AI engine has like a bug or a vulnerability in it, and what kind of laws could be then in place as well to prevent that from happening, or like who's responsible for that if there is a bug, if you're using AI engine, that like type of that's kind of field, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Um, okay, so the, you, we don't have very clear privacy laws <laughs> here. It's it's very um, different state to state, but we have California has kind of been on the cutting edge of that, and then we've had several new states with privacy laws in the last few years, um, which is all kind of tied to transparency. If you're getting someone's personally identifiable information, so. Um, the way you kind of see this in contracts for software, where there's data that is um, being processed by a software vendor, is they will often ask for use in um, aggregated or de-identified information um, for research purposes, which may very well be feeding like an AI type system, knowledge base. So if you're on the other side of that contract in that makes you uncomfortable because you think, well, is it really de-identified? You know, could, could they potentially, you know, re-identify it? Um, you would have to negotiate for those terms changed in your contract. Now, as an individual user, you're not, when you're just clicking agree to terms and nobody here actually reads except me, maybe me, because I have to sometimes. Um, because I'm paid to, that's the only reason you should have to face that. Um, it, you'd have to dig into the terms and conditions and see what they are saying they're going to do with your information. There's privacy policies. Um, and just kind of having an awareness before you put in data that it could be shared and, and used. Um, it's a little bit of a, like, not in my backyard situation where, um, you know, for example, there's uh, this great program called Term Scout, which um, attorneys can use to get, like, the, it analyzes thousands of contracts and they'll say, uh, the trend is for limitation of liability to be X amount. Um, and so when you're negotiated contract, you can say, hey, look at this, your terms are not market. And so I want this more or less, whatever. Um, as great of a tool as that is to use, all the advice from my colleagues is like, but don't put your contract in there, right? So you want the output and it's a great resource, but you don't want to risk putting your potentially confidential sensitive information in to feed the machine. So there's a, a balance there, figuring out how to get good data. Um, without, with, with, while being transparent, I guess. And as for vulnerabilities in the AI tools we're looking at right now, it's very interesting because so many folks are using ChatGPT especially for coding and just to crank out the code for them. And it was a buggy, but most of it is, is usable. And to be honest, there's nothing that would keep ChatGPT from, say, running a check on your machine at the same time that all your Windows licenses are paid up. Uh, or if it was not Windows, perhaps just give me access to your root, give me access to, the <laughs> to your shell. Now maybe the, the hacker panel after this will give you the specific code to do this or the prompts to have ChatGPT do this to your friends. Bad Andrew. But, uh, Bad Andrew. <laughs> but it does come back to the idea of we do got to check the work that comes out of that stuff. And uh, theoretically, stuff could slip in. Right now, not seeing it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I want to try to go to a little bit of a speed round on our answers since we got a line. All right, since we're in a speed run, I have a J question for James no. Ashley. So I'm really curious about <laughs> prompt engineering. And you made a really great simile of you have a master painter and his underlings who paint for him. What do you think the future of prompt engineering is? Mm -hmm. Future of prompt engineering, so that's almost like a new career people have developed. I used to have a lot of friends who are in VR and AR, and they're all AI prompt engineers now. <laughs> um, but what a lot of them are doing is figuring out 
it's hard to figure out prompt engineering. It's basically you're going into the equivalent of config files in Word to make it work differently. And a lot of companies are building uh, UI tools on top of the current generative AI stuff. This is what's going to be big in the next six months. You're going to have hundreds of different online vendors giving you a subscription for $25 a month that will say, uh, handle your complete online presence for you. That's your Twitter, your uh, Facebook, and everything else, right? That's one idea. You've got 20 companies working on that. Um, and this goes to the idea of having a word equivalent for AI. Um, that's kind of the future of prompt engineering at this point, people making it easier. But the other side is also the big companies. Currently, tweaking your models is really difficult. You've got the LLM, you use it the way it's given you. You've got ChatGPT4, use it the way it's given you. And if you ever want to change it or add additional data to narrow down the hallucinations, it's going to cost you millions of dollars to retrain. Except at the end of the year, we know Amazon's got a tool that they've got lined up that's going to make it much cheaper and commoditize training uh, additional data for your generative AI. And we know, well, if Amazon's going to do that, then Microsoft's going to do that about a month later, right? And pretty soon, we're going to have a lot of options, and we're going to have a price war to make it really easy for everybody. Uh, yeah, so that's the future of uh, prompt engineering over the next six months, I think. And I'm not even sure what happens after that. That's a lot. It's getting automated yeah. already. Right. Yeah. So my question is, um, I believe some AI programs for art generation, uh, generating art. Um, some of them you can pay like a sus subscription, and then uh, your um, the art you use you generate with AI, it's not shared publicly, so it's kind of yours. But I'm wondering if you can actually make it yours and copyright it. So you you would use the system, I guess, give it some sort of a, a prompt, and yes. then it would create something, and then you're asking, could you then copyright what's come out of that? Like making right. my own, as to use it for like a book cover. Oh, use it. Oh, well, that okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So right now, you could use that because it's not really owned by anyone else. You wouldn't. There's nowhere to go for permission. Um, the risk is if you don't know what input it used and if that input is easy to trace and maybe more um, obvious than you realize and someone looks at your book and says hey that's clearly a, der a derived from my work and then they can show that it came through that system then you might be in trouble um, but for so that's a risk of using AI right now is that I, I haven't seen that kind of uh, litigation yet where people have gone after the uh, end user in that way but um, if you don't know where it's come from and it, it could be there there's AI that says uh, just like when you go to Spotify now in, in theory the music has been licensed they have permission to stream it um, and there's lots of resources for um, uh, open source sort of graphics and they could if, it, if it's using that kind of uh, input then you you're definitely safe but if you don't know where they're learning from, then it's a little bit sketchy. And if you don't own the copyright, I can use your cover for my porn. Yeah. <laughs> so w one of the things I'll add there. So the, there's another answer to this, too, which is that, um, for example, Tor.com went out and grabbed one off of MidJourney that people tracked down where the source came from. Even though they did adapt it, Tor, as a large publisher, took a pretty heavy hit when that cover rolled out because a lot of people are watching. Yes, you you know even if you do take that and generate a book cover, there are a lot of artists, a term I'm putting in quotes, that are creating book covers right now using that. I know, and some of them look quite good. They're you know they've got what they're looking. So yes, there's people doing it, but most people that are doing it effectively are using that either as an inspiration or something that is creating parts they're going to use in a new original work. Hello, also first time participant. Uh, I've just got a whole slew of questions and my <laughs> mind is all over the place, but I'll just stick with one for now. Uh, with the advent of AI and 
you know, in video games, there's no particular reason that uh, everybody's video gaming experience has to be exactly the yep. same. If you can use AI to customize each individual person's experience, are those individual experiences copyrightable if they're all different? Like, I play a lot of text-based games that just sure. sh just throw artwork up of the characters, but it's not crucial to the story. All right. Hey, just real quick, have you tried a website called AIDungeon.com? Oh, yeah. No. That's an LLM for right. generating role-playing <laughs> games, mm -hmm. and it's multiplayer. Yep. Every game is unique, they claim. Yeah. And actually, uh, part of a, diff a, a different but related project, we're talking about using the same tools we're building right now, would actually allow you, um, if you step into somebody's story, um, what you would be able to do is go in, play it, and if you had enough fun with it, it would actually go back in and then generate a comic from that automatically that you would only have access to digitally and it would only be through a proprietary technology. So you would not be able to necessarily go print it or sell it, but you could have a memory of that, that, that lived experience. It, and I mean, you'd have to, the other question is like, why would you want or need it to be copyright protected unless, you know, you're the game designer and a script has been created and then you want to publish it again somewhere else in some way, um, taking it out of the context of that individual experience. I don't think there's any uh, commercial reason to sort of protect a, um, a, a temporary experience or something that kind of exists in that, for that moment. Right, we deal with the, with the mod community already. I want modders to make mods of my game. I want them to create a personalized experience of my game. They can't sell it, but I want them to use my engine, my game, and do all these things already. Every large company right now is looking at that individualized experience. I mean, they, I want to put you in your game with an LLM of you so that you are actually in it. Uh, now, who's going to own that, et cetera, it doesn't matter, but I want to be the one selling you that game that you can then put yourself in. Thank you. Uh, if I have more, do I go back a line? Come, come hang out left or the yeah. after the next thing. Oh. oh. We're going to be lucky to get these three in. Hi. Uh, my question is a little bit inspired by one of like the SAC AFTRA concerns where like the way um, they were like saying that they were scanning people's like actors' bodies and paying mm -hmm. them for half a day of work and blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then they would have no right on how that's being used, or would they the would be compensated? Deep fakes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, like, my concern is, like, I'm an artist, uh, and I work for the video game industry, um, and like how that could translate to our industry of like how, like, let's say, someone is hired to create like a certain numbers of concept arts right. for the for this video game, and then they're paid for like a month worth of worth of work, and then the company has a right to use these and like fit it into an AI and create more and more concepts. So my question would be, what would you think um, the, what would you think would be some like protections that us as artists could start like thinking sure. of to protect ourselves and get compensated just like the way um, uh, television writers used to get compensated per episode in back in the time, mm -hmm. like so something like royalties, residuals, or? and royalties. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We it's don't give artists residuals in the game industry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there actually are a couple things that are are in play here. So if we talk about likeness, like Bruce, Bruce Willis licensed his likeness so that he can actually appear in other movies and films. That's something he was done before he <laughs> went down the current path. Um, this is one of the fights that's there with the with SAG, right? Because one of the things the studios are wanting to do, like I have a lot of friends that are actors, where they're going and saying, hey, look, if we just, um, you were a background actor number three, we now have your likeness, we can just scan it in and use that over and over again. That image could then theoretically be licensed and sold to a game company to create, you know, dead body number four in the zombie game. Um, so one of the things that's gone on in the sports industry, and this is part of the reason we saw college players now being compensated, is because gaming companies were using those likenesses right. to sell football, basketball games, and stuff that were college-based. So there's already a lot of move here around ownership. Do I own what I look like, as pretty as I am? <laughs> Do I actually own it? Cover my porn. <laughs> You're gonna have to pay a lot for that one. 
And I mean, and, and artists do have very specific restrictions on how their their image could be used, and some of it might be strictly strictly porn or you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, tentacle <it's>, porn. <laughs> Um, so to answer your question, uh, a real life example, one of our clients at our firm is a media production company that had uh, put to release some cartoons and they have these recordings of the actors' voices um, that under a work for hire agreement that basically the company, production company, owns that recording and has all rights to it. Of course, this was recorded, I don't know, a few years ago before this AI was a, a well, not before it was a thing, but before it was a Public hot conscious. topic. Yes, exactly. And now they're getting approached by a company that wants to do like, um, oh gosh, what is it called? You know, when you get like these C-list actors to say like, happy birthday, Steve, or whatever. What yeah. this? A cameo. It's like a cameo, but for cartoon characters. And so they're like, can we use the recordings of our, these voices um, to sort of populate these cameo type messages? So the analysis for us is like, okay, yeah, you own that recording, so you can do whatever you want with it under a work for hire agreement. Then very quickly, we looked at our talent contracts, because law firms, you know, can represent both sides, and made sure our talent contracts <laughs> moving forward said, you cannot use this for, uh, you know, Gen AI move, uh, in, for future use. And kind of, so it's all about your scope of your license and what your, what your contracting uh, use. So putting limits on that. Um, and then the other thing we had to think about was like, okay, but who specifically are the actors? And are any of their voices recognizable in and of themselves? Are they super famous? It's so like a Morgan Freeman where somebody, where there might be, um, then you get into publicity rights issues where someone might say that um, they think that he's endorsed this program or whatever you're getting to say, we wouldn't want them to use the voices to be like, uh, here's this cartoon character saying shop at blah, blah, blah store, you know, shop at Walmart, because then it's getting into marketing. So um, there's all kinds of contractual limitations that you can put in. And, and this is the one reason I do recommend you be explicit about the rights you're licensing, not... Right. So yeah. this has been specific to game art for uh, decades now, uh, especially since mocap became an issue. And we were capturing people's motions with a specific idea that we would then own it and do things, manipulate it in all sorts of crazy, freaky ways. And we have to do that. We have to have rights to change it because we don't know what it's going to have to be at the end of this game. And we're going to do derivative works off it. We want that character to come back. We could have rights to do stuff to that character down the line. Now, the issue has been people have been selling these mocap catalogs where they've got all the rights to it. You can do, then do whatever to it. Same with our sound catalogs. I buy these sound effects catalogs, and I can manipulate those uh, those digital files, uh, all the audio files, any way I want to put into my games. I need that. I need that kind of freedom as well. But you're absolutely right. It is now the question, what are we selling? What are we going to allow folks to do with it? Because AI can squeeze you out of the equation, and we don't want that. And part of that, I'll say it again, it's going to be the backlash against companies that pull that stuff. All right, and I know we're at time, so this will be the last question because, you know, I've never ended on time. All right. Um, this question has two parts. Uh, it's an example case, probably for Michelle. Um, say, for example, Stephen King had an AI that was trained only on his work, mm -hmm. and it produced more work that was synergies of his work that already existed. Would that be copyrightable by Stephen King, and does the answer change if Stephen King was the one who created the machine learning model that did it? So Stephen King has, in, has given it permission, I guess, right? And, and could he say that this is mine because it's only been based on his work? That's a really interesting scenario. Um, and I could totally see someone doing that so, if they're well, tired actually, of writing their own things. Oh, yeah, we, no, I mean, we've got one author here. I was pan we were paneling last night on yep. AI mm. and books who went and built his own LLM, built entirely on his own work. Yep. I know a couple of other authors that here are doing this or have done this. Part of the intent with this project is to do this where we will be building our own LLM to segment people's IP. And he took it, built that with his own works to speed up generating stuff for himself, but it's not to create a finished work, it's to create a starting point, but it's already in his own voice, his own style, to accelerate. He's got some funny stories about using it too. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, because again, 
LLMs hallucinate. I mean, these damn things are smoking weed when they're turned off. I mean, <laughs> and I mean, man, could he register it if he's forthcoming with the copyright office and said it was generated using an AI system? I don't know that the copyright office is sophisticated enough in asking where the data came from to uh, to train that system yet. I don't think they've had to have that question. Um, but it's more like he. So the only reason you actually need to register something with the Copyright Office specifically is to enforce that right. So then you're going to get a really interesting situation if somebody infringes on the AI Stephen King book, um, if he's going to be in a position, if he's going to have standing to sue to say that that was his, or is it, no, this is in the, um, there, there, there's no, yeah, no, no, no copyrightable element there. To pick on the artist, this is already becoming an issue there. Folks are looking to train Dolly type things for text-to-speech just on their art. Artists who have this huge catalog that they can throw into it, and you want a dragon in this style with a barbarian, etc., and they can just press a button and have it turn out. I think by the general readings right now, if he doesn't do anything to it beyond give it the input and then press the button, there's no copyright right now by the readings. Copyright mm -hmm. Office is asking for... Uh, yeah, there, and that might is change. A, ...is asking oh. for things. But I think under the reading of the law right now, you don't, there's no copyright to it. Which doesn't make a lot of sense, which is why it's so... <laughs> 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 All right, well, so thank you guys. Um, I've got a little swag up here if anybody cares or is interested. I've got a lot of swag. But thank you guys for coming out tonight. Great right up. <laughs>